Okay, great. So I think it's uh, one or three, so uh, it'll be, it's a good time to get started. Uh, welcome everyone to the Connected Insights Web Summit and to today's panel discussion. Uh, thank you for joining and super excited to have all of you here today. There's going to be a lot of value packed into today's session, so please make the most of it by engaging with all the speakers. Uh, uh, just to give, tell you a little bit, a bit about myself, my name is Priya Shakari, and I'm a co-founder and partner at uh, Connected Law. Uh, Connected Law is the legal advisory arm of Consolidon, and uh, we're a new age law firm, and what we do is we connect clients with senior lawyers and boutique firms. Uh, so we make sure that all our matters are carried out in a very cost-effective rate, and we're trying to disrupt the law industry. Um, this session is meant to be really interactive, so I would, uh, you know, it would be great if you could type your questions, uh, you know, in the chat box during the course of uh, today's discussion. We'll either address them then and there, or we will uh, answer them during the Q&A session at the end. So uh, today's topic is, is actually quite a hot topic. It's about uh, startups, valuations, and, and, and budgets. Uh, it's all about how it's going to be very relevant if you want to take your company to the next level. And we'd love to hear, uh, hear from all the experts who've been there, done that. Uh, funding startups is, is something that every start is an important milestone of every startup's journey. And we need to make sure that, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're walking in the right direction. So we're gonna get a lot of tips today from, uh, from our panelists. I'm really excited to, do, to also introduce to you uh, today's panel of experts. We have uh, Hervé from MDM Consulting, Stefan Hickmott from Newfields Group and Kirill from uh, Emerix. So maybe what we could do is we can do a quick round of introduction uh, from each of the panelists themselves. and. Uh, you know, would love to know more about them, and that'll be amazing for the attendees as well. Uh, perhaps we could start with Hervey. Okay, yes. Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending. So I'm Hervé Marché. I've been spending 20 years of my life in corporate and 10 years as an entrepreneur. I've been living in France, in the US, in Latin America, in the UK and the UAE. Uh, in terms of corporate, my big job was uh, an executive position with Apple for 12 years uh, at the time of Steve era, that uh, we say. And then for the last nine years, I've co-founded four startups. Three have been sold. So one in streaming has uh, been sold to Workday. One, the computer vision has been sold to Fiat Chrysler. And uh, one in the fleet management and optimization have been sold to my local uh, sponsor and very important family. And the last one that I'm still uh, running at this time is in the renewable energy. And uh, I also do a little bit of consulting uh, for organization, team buildings, as well as helping startups. Oh, that's amazing, Harvey. I think we're going to have a really insight. We're going to, there's a lot to learn from you, so uh, thanks a lot for your introduction. Uh, maybe we could, uh, we could have uh, Stefan next. Sure. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone today. Uh, my name is Stefan Hickmott. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called New Fields uh, Management in uh, the DIFC, Dubai International Financial Center in Dubai. Um, we set up the company last year. I've been actually in the region, I'm living in Dubai, working here for 20 years. Um, we specialize in advisory services uh, for companies looking to scale up, uh, looking to raise capital, give some support to that aspect and their readiness to do that uh, and, and help them from the A to Z of growing and fostering their businesses. I've, I've, I've been involved in the private equity space for quite a long time and in the advisory space. I've actually advised or, or invested into about a thousand different projects involving about $50 billion of value. Um, I've personally been involved in raising capital, raising debt and mentoring and advising uh, tech startups and the like recently to, to get them onto a really strong pathway of success. Um, thanks, Stefan, and apologies. I just realized that I was pronouncing your name the other way, <laughs> not, not, not the right pronunciation, but anyway, 
thanks a lot for your introduction. I think, uh, you know, uh, you're going to have a lot of insights. You've been in the region for so long. So I'm really looking forward to learning from you. Uh, and over to you, uh, Kirill. Yes, hello, guys. My name is Kirill. I am the chief sales officer at Emerex Mena Change. Uh, my background is more than 10 years in IT business development in CIS region. So I run a lot of goods into CIS region for Lenovo, for Hewlett Packard before. I jumped into crypto industry and blockchain industry in 2017. And from small meetup, we uh, issue our Emirates company. Uh, we close uh, uh, crowdfunding for $1.4 million. We closed the seed round with... Uh, uh, for equity with California fund. And right now we are on the stage of a round. So my background is business development and I built a global brands right now. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Kirill. In fact, uh, you're venturing into a really uh, mysterious and uh, to a lot of us, it's mysterious, the whole crypto world. So would love to know more about, uh, you know, your journey and, and, and how it works. Uh, so thanks a lot, everyone, uh, everyone, for your quick introduction. And maybe now we can just get started with, uh, you know, uh, our discussion. Uh, so before we start, I think it would be good to take a few steps back before we talk about funding. And maybe we could focus a little bit about what a startup needs to do before they think about funding. I guess they would need to organize themselves. And, and maybe, uh, Stefan, you could tell us a little bit, little bit about what a startup needs to do before they think about funding. Sure, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was privileged during my career to work for some large private equity firms. And uh, I probably had more than 250, 300 different groups come in and pitch projects and investments uh, to us. So I, I like to think I've probably got some very strong insights to offer people uh, that are looking to raise capital, looking to progress and evolve their projects and their businesses. Um, and, and some of the key things I, I would say for, for startups is, is don't concentrate in terms of how you present yourself to the world only on the idea and only on the, um, uh, on the entrepreneurialism. That's, a, that's obviously an extremely important component to any potential investor to see you know, the strength of the idea, uh, how compelling it is, how passionate the entrepreneurs are uh, around that and how well they document and profile that in, in, the way, in their communications. But also I think what's becoming more and more important, particularly in this day and age, is in order for startups to sort of set themselves apart from others is to, is to organize themselves um, in terms of how, they, um, how they, they, they do their business plan, they set their KPIs, they have you know, governance standards, and they have some of these key elements sort of sewn in right at the beginning of their uh, organization because uh, in the years to come, when they go raising bigger amounts of capital, what typically will happen is those larger institutions will audit, uh, look at the audit sort of trail of, of the whole company from the very beginning. So even though you may organize yourselves very well in two years time when you go for your Series A, um, you know, companies want to look back and see, well, how did you organize yourself? How did you manage your business uh, proficiently from the very beginning? Now, of course, there's a lot of leeway in that, you know, entrepreneurs at the very beginning aren't expected to be able to, you know, do things uh, in, in, a, in a beautiful, pristine way in terms of everything organized. But uh, I think it's important to sort of sow those elements of the, into your DNA that you're that you, you, you have a good attendance records when you go to meetings, that you, sh you record everything well in writing, you document, keep good security and integrity over your data, um, that you're fair to your stakeholders, um, that you, 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 you set good governance policies, you have, you know, setting this sort of framework is very, very important to illustrate to the investors in certainly right now, but also in, you know, very much in the future that, that you have standards that you, you you've applied at the beginning and you live to to that day um, and that really helps for investors to see look i'm coming into a long-term sort of partnership with my money into this company mm -hmm. i want to see that they're aligned with my risks and they've mitigated my risk by showing that they're they're a very very strong sort of winning team 
um, not just in terms of their idea, but in terms of how they how they manage and propel their idea, if you will. Yeah. No, sounds good. And and Stefan, uh, when it comes to uh, talent, uh, does it make sense for a startup to let's say outsource their talent? Because a lot of times, you know, uh, founders don't really have the budget to hire somebody. Uh, when it comes to outsourcing talent, how, how does that work? Sure, I think that's a very good question. I mean, clearly, um, outsourcing makes sense if there's relevant parties that can be outsourced to you know things like digital marketing things like accounting clearly they're mm -hmm. sort of some of them are quite sort of functional sort of aspects mm -hmm. to your organization that can be easily fulfilled by you know outsourcing uh, to, mm -hmm. to competent groups and sometimes those competent groups have a brand and their brand mm -hmm. equity can help you know so if you've got kpmg doing your auditing it may not cost you actually very mm -hmm. much money but it's a nice little brand to have in your in your deck you know um, but at the same time, you know, as you grow, I think what's, again, going back to my point previously, really, it's, it's quite important to illustrate to investors in the future that, you know, um, you have a management team and a team of people that have worked together for a long period of time, hopefully many months or maybe years, and when you come to raise money in two years' time. So you're not going to fall out with each other tomorrow. You haven't just met each other, you know, in a restaurant, mm -hmm. you know, last week or something. So if you can pull people into your organization in more of a sort of full-time basis um, and start to, to sort of embed those processes into your DNA as soon as you possibly can, um, I think that, that does help to strengthen your case as you evolve later on. But, but certainly in terms of the initial stages, you know, outsourcing makes tremendous sense. Um, uh, and of course, I would encourage a lot of people to not take on too much cost burden and take up, take on too much, uh, you know, too many staff too quickly. I mean, very mm -hmm. often one of the challenges for for startup companies is, uh, as they get to scale, they end up, you know, at the beginnings is very much focusing on their idea, their mm -hmm. concept, and propelling that forward. But if you then grow to a much bigger team, you can end up, you know, having to manage a bigger team of people, uh, more sort mm -hmm. of internal organizational issues. And that can be sometimes a bit of a challenge for some of the entrepreneurs. So mm. it's good to try and identify what your strengths and weaknesses are at the beginning in these areas and try and map mm. your, your roadmap from the very beginning of how you're going to use outsourcing effectively, but also make sure you're embedding a lot of this sort of IP that people can, can create in your organization, the culture uh, and the effectiveness, mm. embed that as quickly as possible into your organization. Yeah. No, that's a lot of uh, that's a, that's a, that's very useful, Stefan. Uh, Harvey, maybe you could uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit, a little bit about your experience in terms of building a team in startups because I know that, that that's quite a challenge for startups just having you know a strong team. Yeah, and, and I will really take uh, back exactly what say Stefan. No, don't rush. Don't because you have a little bit of money. Don't try to hire everybody you know friends and family sometimes in some of the startup that we see that people want to, to, to make it happen sometimes too fast, not organized. So the building the team for me is really to do a, a good mix of what the founders can do and what they are missing. So it's a, it's a school of modesty because you know, sometimes when you create a, a startup, you believe you can do everything. And at the end of the day, uh, it's impossible. So you need to make sure that you bring talent aside of you and you choose the good one because, uh, like Stefan was saying, you have only one one chance. You know, if you change every six months of team, it's going to be very bad uh, when we look be looking for financing. What also I recommend is that in most of the startup, we don't see right at the beginning senior. Okay, so maybe because I'm a senior person, I say that, but I may say that it, it's, okay. it's a good opportunity to bring quite fast in the process one or two senior person that have big experience and that will bring the balance between the enthusiasm, between the passion, between all mm. of this energy that is great to have, but will bring also back to reality. And I think that's, that, that's, that's very important. But just and sorry to interrupt, Harvey, but when you say, you know, bringing a senior person, do you bring that person as a mentor or as like, you know, as like a co-founder or a founder? Because, you know, a senior person would be an expensive resource. Mm -hmm. I think it needs to be uh, brought as a co-founder. Uh, okay. And uh, I've seen a lot of, of these co-founders coming and putting some money as equity to be I part of, of, of the team. And I think that's, that's one element. 
Then to uh, answer to your question, building the team, you know, you need to attract people, you need to motivate them, and you need to keep them. So uh, I may say to attract them, you need a vision. Uh, you need to have like, uh, uh, you are going to be part of a dream team, you need to embark in the journey. So that's like a, a little bit of attract, the way to attract the people. The motivation, I think that I've seen two things in startup is that, uh, when you start in a startup, you want to do things that you like to do. So mm -hmm. it's, you have to make sure that when you bring talent, what you told them that they will do in the startup, it's exactly what they will do. Because if you start to have them doing totally different things, you lose the motivation, you lose the enthusiasm, and they need to enjoy what they do because it's difficult, uh, because they have pressure, but you know, are we going to survive in six months? Are we going to survive in 12 months? So if you don't have the fun and the engagement, that's not good enough. And then to keep the people, uh, me and my philosophy is to share the pie. So you need to give very fast shares. You need to have the people you know that really embark in your journey. And it's not only about money, it's also about responsibilities. So if you bring talent, you need to make sure that they have responsibilities in the company and it's not a one man or one woman show of founders and that they are also, uh, that and I like to, you know, uh, I don't know if everybody know Ronis Kurala that uh, created a fantastic company, you know, in, in India. And you say there's no plan B in startup, and I did like the idea, but I always say the only plan B that you have if your idea is not good is the acquire for hire, meaning that you have a fantastic team and you still have value with this team. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, just one question there uh, do you think that everybody gets motivated by equity? Like, because I know that, you know, it's, it's a mix of, you know, your salary and equity. And do people, you know, value equity because, you know, 90% of startups fail? So I think, I think that when you're coming a startup and you're not going to a big salary, there are a few things that can be motivated. Equity is part of it. Uh, I've been in my renewable energy company at this time with the motivation is to work at 80% of the time, which for me was a total paradox for a startup because for me, uh, I work 120% of my time, but some of the developers, they want to work 80% of the time. So that's another maybe motivation factor. Uh, it's all about recruiting talent. You need, you need to find the sweet spot of what makes the person happy. If you believe that this person should join your company and maybe some is equity, maybe it's time, maybe it's the ambience. Uh, with COVID it's more difficult at this time because it's a lot of on remote. But definitely, you need to find something that attracts the people. No, no, thanks a lot, Harvey, for your insights. In fact, we have a question from one of the attendees for Stefan. Uh, you know, how, how about the equity parting for outsourced business like digital marketing? How much of equity to be offered? Do you have um, any tips there? It's a very good question. I mean, look, um, the context of startups obviously varies enormously in terms of how much capital they have at the beginning, how much money they need to propel their idea forward until such point as they can perhaps attract, you know, significant equity that they need to take forward. <clears throat> but I would say that um, uh, there's, a, there's sometimes a temptation for startups to sort of try and draw upon resources and sort of offer them a kind of IOU, you know, you know, I'll pay you through this and that. And then you just got to be a bit mindful that you don't overstretch yourself with too many promises that don't quite come through in, in the expectations of others. Um, but I, I think uh, there is an opportunity sometimes to bring in some of these people as partners. Um, uh, you know, you just have to measure up, you know, what, what's their overall input in terms of, you know, value versus how much value you're giving of your, your company. Of course, in the, in the context of most startups, uh, entrepreneurs will usually value their company much stronger than anybody else for good reasons, because they have the vision and they can see perhaps the potentiality more than anybody else. But it, equally, I would always encourage people to give, um, to try and be, always put your mind, your, your, your mind in, 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 you know, in terms of, look at it in terms of uh, how others see you, uh, how investors would see you, how resources that are being given to you perhaps for free, as it were, um, uh, how, how they see you and how um, uh, try to look at it in their perspective. Um, and you can see that there's quite a lot of risk sometimes for these other external parties of them giving you all these services for free on, on a maybe and a hope, you know. So 
Um, I think you just need to try and balance it out. I would, I would encourage most startups, if possible, to start with, with the cash, uh, with the sufficient cash to be able to, to use cash uh, to get where they need to, because it's kind of the responsible best way to go. Um, and try to, if there's a little bit of extension, you need quite a lot of input from someone, give them a bit of an equity slice. Yeah, that makes sense. It's impossible to say what sort of numbers you should look at there because yeah. it just depends how much you need digital marketing, how much you don't need it. So, um, but, you know, bringing in people uh, on the on terms that where they feel that they're fairly looked after is, is very important because you want to get the best out of them. They've got to feel good with the deal, you know. So normally it's, it's a small amount, you know, it would never be a huge amount. Um, but, you know, sometimes that can be a very good thing to give them, bring them in on the equity, particularly it's a long-term relationship. You really want to propel forward that they can they can get a lot more out of it as a company if they go forward. So, so yeah, that's my general yeah. sort of response, really. Yeah, no, thanks a lot, Steph. And that's a good point because it can be challenging to motivate somebody just on the basis of equity. Equity, and that's what I've seen as well with a lot of startups. Uh, you know, if, if if it's a role, if it's a very minor role in a company, then you know you'd rather pay them cash, and that's what you know, they'll, they'll get the work done. But if it's equity, then they might not really take it that seriously. Uh, but Kirill, maybe uh, you could tell us a little bit, a little bit about, uh, you know, your experience in terms of how, you know, let's say you, uh, you manage your, you know, retaining employees, and is it that they get a stake in the company, or even with outsourced resources, do you, do you, uh, do you provide an equity stake in the company? Yes, very good questions. I'm personally, I'm start from business development on top position. And I also have my personal uh, experience in, in building startups mm -hmm. and uh, opening and closing LLC inside CIS region. Uh, my personal case start from hiring me as a, uh, as a top guys. And I have uh, uh, some uh, shares inside uh, Emirates company. And this is how motivates me to build brand, to build relationship. Because, for example, company at the beginning of startups, they could not hire top executives. Uh, according to their burning rate, they couldn't cover expensive salaries. But if they could motivate with uh, uh, ex extra shares, extra bonus growth, or et cetera, et cetera, it's uh, a good uh, st starting point. So also for, for my team with whom I build the business, they also have some, uh, some shares uh, inside company if they on top position. And in blockchain industry, we even spread uh, internal uh, exchange tokens. It's a really uh, easy tool for motivation because we have price and we could easily sell them on the market. I see. No, no, that's a good point. And and let's say to outsource, do you outsource to all the outsourced resources? Do you yes, provide yes. equity? So from 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 every beginning, so we try to do everything by ourselves, with mm -hmm. a small team, with not expensive ex employees from CIS region. So like for your for understanding, average salary in Dubai is around uh, I don't know two three thousand dollars in CIS is five hundred dollars. So, and the more we grow, the more burning rate uh, uh, decrease in co competitive margin. We start to hire more, more expensive one uh, guys from, from London, from Dubai, et cetera, et cetera. And we do our out uh, source uh, uh, of, uh, before it was marketing outsource. Right now we do marketing uh, full time from our side. Uh, we run uh, sales uh, traction with CRM mm -hmm. system outsource. It's still outgoing, but they, uh, the sales uh, team physically, they are part of the, our team. So if tomorrow outsource company changed, we do not uh, lose the value. So yeah. this is our current uh, scenario. The, the, but the, the only which we do not outsource is technical because we are technical mm -hmm. team, 50% of us as technical team. Uh, sometimes we uh, outsource some cool new projects, but mm -hmm. we build alliances. 
So if we see niche market with some startup or in a good project or technical team, we uh, we are going to them and say, hey, let's build under our brand, let's build product together. It's also the solution. No, no, thanks a lot, uh, Kirill, for just sharing your experience there. Uh, on this note, uh, you know, I have a question for Herve. Uh, when it comes to developers, because I know that, uh, you know, some, it's always good to have like an internal develop, developer team. How do you deal with them? Because, you know, there's, there's been a huge rise of tech startups and, and the issue that a lot of startups face is, you know, dealing with their dev team because, you know, it's a cash guzzler and, um, and sometimes, you know, the team sort of keeps changing, especially if you outsource it, because uh, I've also experienced that before. If you outsource it and you're, you're not happy with the team then, and you change the team, it, it's just not easy and it, it, it creates a lot of hurdles. So, so what is your, you know, advice on how to deal with the tech team? I think it's, it's going to be very different from country to country or region to region sometimes. Uh, if I take my example, in France, if you hire a PhD, uh, you have like a two years of uh, free, uh, no charge from the government. So it's very interesting. And uh, they also need to commit to stay. And, and in terms of valuation, you know, in tech industry in Europe, we say each PhD is $1 million value. So very often that's, that's, uh, that's I look for PhD because they are more stable than the normal developers very often. Uh, when you say they, PhD, uh, do you mean like, uh, you know, like engineers but, with PhD? Yeah, engineer with PhD, yeah. engineer see, developer with PhD. In okay. fact, uh, my philosophy is to recruit less people and to recruit very high caliber. Uh, very often right away after the labs, because, you know, if they quit the labs, uh, they are not willing to change uh, too often. So I, I, I kind of define the profile of people that will stay for a long time. So that's at the research and development level. That's where the IP is, for instance, for the algorithm, for the artificial intelligence. So I build always two parallel teams, one team of research and algorithm and AI, and one team of execution. And on this team of execution, you know, they can stay for six months or for two years. It doesn't really affect my business. It's, you know, they will develop in Python or C++. So in terms of tech, uh, we can change them very easily if they don't want to stay. So my philosophy is that in terms of development in engineering, you have to have two parallel teams, one core team that really you look after and you make sure they stay forever, and one team that is in the execution, and then there's less trouble if they are leaving the company. I hope it answers your question. No, no, thanks. That's very useful. Uh, so uh, I think the next, uh, you know, uh, before we talk again about val valuation and funding a startup, maybe a quick question to all of the panelists would be on how do you manage your budgets? Because, uh, you know, when you're a startup, your budgets are small. Uh, how, do you, how do you go about running your company and, and managing a budget in that case? Uh, should we start with, maybe we can start with Stefan? Sure. It's a very, very good question. Um, um, it's uh, what, what investors don't want to see uh, is that you say you need $100,000 uh, to get to a certain KPI. And then, you know, uh, $100,000 later, you haven't got anywhere near that and you need another 200000 So try to, to budget what, what your requirements are. And when you do, you know, what investors really want to see, even from the very beginning, is a, a clear business plan and a clear budget, expenditure budget, and, and try to put some good padding into the budget for things that, you know, unknowns, and a good contingency in there, maybe 10, 20% contingency for other things, if you can. And it's better to go out and have a conversation with an investor and say, look, uh, I need 200,000 or $250,000 when you think you might need 150, but clearly show that because the other danger is the investor then looks into it and thinks you only need 100. Why are you asking for 250? So just as, as transparent as you possibly can, every investor wants to make sure that the management team, the entrepreneur is funded. The last thing they want is that the entrepreneur can't afford to live, can't afford to eat, can't afford to wear clothes because mm -hmm. there's no money, you know, because oh, how are they going to prosper the business? So mm -hmm. um, they want to make sure that the entrepreneurs and the business is, is, is going forward. But I think it's just 
is, is, is always factoring the unknowns. There will be delays. There will be things that may come up that cost a bit more money, things you didn't think of. And just try and pad the budget out and go and ask for that little bit more money at the beginning, as it were. That's that's my general sort of initial yes, comment. Well. Yes, that sounds, sounds great. Uh, and any tips there, Kirill, on, on you know, managing budgets? Uh, yes, once you mentioned that uh, that the developers is uh, so expensive and just smiling because they, they at the very beginning they cover everything. So mm -hmm. they take all your budget and you could not even uh, make salary for your own. So you yeah. work for them <laughs> at the beginning. So uh, for cost saving uh, structure, for example, on, on, on my uh, company, we build uh, uh, different type of products and one type of uh, products gives us uh, fast sales to generate more revenue and become profitable and another part of products gi gives us long-term uh, building for example we have solution exchange for a service there the price is half million dollars but leading period of time is like three four months so or mm -hmm. we have like listing service the project space us for listing their projects inside our exchange and this is fa fa fast money and you just need to man manage those budget so to 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 be uh, uh serious to each dollar which you spend for example right now we do not spend any dollar on mar marketing at all so mm -hmm. maximum budget is like i don't know some uh, promo campaign for 500 dollars it's not uh, so serious but mm -hmm. we, we know that everything what we go uh, through expanding the market we do on cooperation side uh in real startup world better to go in a team uh with advisors we, we onboard advisors with a cool technical team uh with partners we onboard partners and for sure investors and it should be a win-win scenario for everybody no, thanks a lot, uh, Kirill, for uh, sharing your insights there. Uh, have any uh, experience on, I mean, what's your experience on managing budgets? You've, you know, like I said, you've managed a lot of companies, so it would be great to hear your insights. Yeah, so I, I think I agree with uh, everything that's been said. I will just add that you need to have a cash burn budget aside of the full BP or normal budget. So you need to be able to see how much cash you burn every month, what is fixed, uh, what is variable, uh, what you can change very fast in one or two months. And mm -hmm. you need to have in mind, you know, we are talking about KPI at the beginning of the discussion. One of the KPI for me in the startup is how many months do you have in front of you? Because when you want to go for the next round, you want to make sure you don't go in a rush. You want to make sure that you have the time. So. On top of this BP and uh, to have a pad and to have uh, making sure that everything is under control is important. But just what you have in your bank, uh, because very often you ask a question to the startup, how much do you have in the bank? I need to ask. No, that's the first thing you need to know. And how many months does it mean to carry your company? And if you have only six months, start to look for money right away. So that's my advice on, on, on budget. Because this from your budget for external, and this is the budget for internal mm -hmm. management. Yeah, I know that's that's such a good point, Avi. Because I've seen a lot of startups, you know, like uh, they have a budget only for like let's say three four months, and it's a very abrupt ending, you know. So if they don't get funding at the end of those let's say three to four months then the operations essentially have to stop right because it, it's going bust so i've seen a couple of startups go bust that way and it's, it's a really abrupt stop right because uh, and 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 the sad story is that it's all because you know the, the budget was not really managed exactly. um so yeah perhaps now we can quickly go into what's uh, you know an ideal pitch deck uh, but that's a question that i guess especially in this region so maybe uh, I'll ask this question, Stefan, because uh, you've, you know, you've had, you have a private equity background, you're, you spend a lot of time, um, you know, you've spent a lot of time investing in companies, uh, especially in this region. So I, I'd like to ask you, uh, 
you know, what's an ideal pitch deck? Is it is it what we see in, you know, the websites that we Google online or do we need to sort of have a special sort of a pitch deck for this region? Uh, great question. Okay, so um, I would say that the vast majority of pitch decks that I see, obviously it depends on whether you're very much a startup or you're going towards more of a series A, you're more evolved, but the vast majority of them tend to concentrate to my mind, far too much on the product, the people, and how and how great everything is, but not enough on what I would say is sort of investor pages of information. So the way to approach a good pitch deck, it's very, very simple. Put yourselves in the mind of the investor or your stakeholder or who you're trying to pitch this to and try and think what are the risks for them how can I mitigate those risks? How can I illustrate that I'm aligned with their mind, with their mindset, with their thinking? Because if you can nail that, you are going to succeed, in my opinion, because um, the, the investor wants to fund people. You know, a lot, of, a lot of investors have money. They want to deploy it. OK, so you don't need to worry about the, necessarily that, you know, that they may not have any money. I mean, if, you, if you've vetted them and they've got funds and they want to deploy them, then, then that's that sorted. Um, what they want to see is, you know, obviously a great idea, obviously something that's perhaps scalable and perhaps, uh, you know, that, that can that can go, you know, uh, you know, 10x or more. But they want to see that alignment from from the entrepreneur to them as the investor. What does that really mean? It means exactly like I said, I've identified the risks to you, the investor. You know, what if this goes wrong? What if we don't hit this KPI? What if um, you know, something else happens here and there. And we've mitigated those risks. So we've already identified them up front and we've come up with mitigation strategies for them. So that's just one sort of illustration, but it's to show that you're not just taking the money and then coming back six months later going, actually, we just need more money because, you know, some things came up that we didn't realise. I mean, that's just disorganised. That's the sort of thing that's a bit of a disaster, you know? What you want to do is show that you are the investor when you go in to meet the investor, that you are them in mindset. And you are really, really then, I think, you're, you're, you're going to stand a much, much stronger chance of compelling uh, an investor than, than the others that don't do that, put it that way. Mm, no, interesting perspective, uh, you know, to put ourselves in the shoes of the investor. I've never really, really thought about that. But are there any, you know, resources that, uh, you know, you would suggest in terms of uh, looking to uh, create a pitch deck? Like, like for the Middle East region, would you say that is there any special sort of a thing that we need to keep in mind? Or, or is it pretty much uh, it works the same way all across the world? I, I would say that uh, I wouldn't say there's anything particularly special here. Uh -huh. um, what you really need for a good pitch deck is obviously to show a strength team so exactly like we were saying before you've got some senior people some expert people even if mm -hmm. they're advisors to the company that shows a, a breadth of knowledge and expertise mm -hmm. uh, you clearly illustrate and document your project your your business the potentiality thereof uh, and and obviously illustrate all the factors that the investor needs to see so how much money are you asking for uh, how is it going to be used? So the source and use of money is very, very important to illustrate how they're going to get return on investment, what sort of time period, what happens, as I was saying a minute ago, if it goes wrong, what happens if these risks come into play? How do you mitigate them? You've already got your mitigation strategy in place, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and clearly showing this and illustrating this information uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a crisp way. Uh, and of course, uh, we as a company, Newfields, help, help clients build these sorts of uh, documents uh, and, and prepare themselves for these sorts of events. Uh, but um, the, the, the point is that um, I, I think it's probably pretty much the same here as it is anywhere else. Um, mm. uh, I think um, sometimes here it can be a bit more, um, shall we say, it depends whether it's, it's more sort of VC money and things where they'll, if it's quite early stages, they'll kind of, that they can just cut a check just to sort of back quite a lot of different opportunities and see which ones come through. Um, mm. Some VC funds have that sort of strategy, which is good for the entrepreneur um, because they don't need to just prove the, the case for their project when it's a very, mm. very nascent stage, you know, to the nth degree. Um, but, uh, but equally, um, be prepared for quite a lot of detailed questions 
and stress testing and grilling <laughs> entrepreneurs as they go forward to raise bigger amounts of money. Uh, but I think it's pretty much the same process here as anywhere else. But of course, it's important to say that raising money, you know, is a regulated activity. So you need to work uh-huh. with the right regulated uh, advisors to, to if you're going to formally go and raise money and pitch your and solicit uh, prospective sources. So just be mindful of the laws and the regulations because that's very, very important. Don't, don't go marketing out your opportunity for investment uh, if you're in breach of the laws and regulations. So I would advise again, yeah. everyone just make sure that they're very aware of what those are. Yeah. No, no, makes a lot of sense, uh, Stefan. Uh, is there are there any like specific uh, VCs or private equity firms that you think in this region that you could like uh, you know just ma- mention a few names that that could possibly that that, that are the ones that invest? Uh, well, uh, there's uh, MEVP, Middle East Venture mm. Partners. There's Plus VC is a new one. I know mm. the founders of that, which are uh, a very very strong team of people with a great track record of of um of deploying raising and deploying uh, capital in the region uh obviously there's there's the likes of wanda Bico, and there's many others uh, that, that will back uh companies at different stages um so um some are quite keen actually to go for companies that are very nascent very need much need need sort of incubator sort of capital and others that won't look at putting a dollar in unless there's some revenue there's mm-hmm. some scalable, very clear scalable nature to their business. So mm-hmm. it's forces for courses, to be honest. Um, and again, yeah. you know, a company like us can help navigate that space in, in, as a research exercise for people. But, um, but you know, you, the, the one thing I would say, uh, which is quite important is, yeah, there are quite a lot of angel type investors out there, actually, if you find mm-hmm. them, mm-hmm. that do like smart people with smart ideas. Um, and mm-hmm. don't be afraid if you, really just got a smart idea and, and, and you need some help and some money to help put that together. Don't feel that you have to get everyone to work for you for free to try and put it into a shape uh, to go forward with. Uh, it's not necessarily the case. Um, if you connect with the right places, you can find that that sort of big brother or big sister kind of investor to, to get yeah. to join you yeah. early on, yeah. No, no, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, maybe on that note, I'm going to quickly ask Kirill about your experience with investment, because I know that your invest, your company is crowdfunded. Uh, and that's sort of quite a new thing in this region. So if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, how you crowdfunded your company. I also understand that you pretty much avoided uh, too much of dilution in your company. You, you only had about 2% dilution by virtue of your crowdfunding. So can you tell us a little a little, little bit about uh, you know your process of raising funds through that uh, novel process. I mean through that uh, through crowdfunding. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the questions. So our journey starts from the white paper. So mm-hmm. we uh, write everything what we plan to build uh, Emirex uh, brand for for mean region. So we uh, invest our own money to build prototype and with uh, only uh, one feature to, to de- de- deploy, to, to sell uh, uh, tokens, uh, governance tokens on blockchain to raise the funds from crowdfunding. And we spend budget for registered our company in, in Europe uh, to get uh, crypto license, uh, cryptocurrency license to be legal uh, in 192 countries for fundraising. Only US is not allowed. So, and after it, uh, we spend a little bit marketing, uh, networking. We, uh, we uh, attach cool advisors to the project who are still uh, with us more than two years. And the more guys are onboarding. And this is how we collect our first $1.4 million in tokens. And for that, we give the, uh, the customers the tokens, uh, which we listed on different exchanges. In the future, even we listed on our exchange. And they have somehow f- fixed the profit. So the price was around uh, 11 cents, and they sell it around 4 cents, 6 cents. So it's for, for different investors, it was like 
x4, x6 uh, uh, profit. So after it, we build the product and we go to seed round on equity side to be more well, well known on the market. And right now we are on a round for, for local investors and global investors to be more presented with a local license in MENA region. This is our journey. I see, I see. So, so do you have a presence in, in the Middle East at the moment, uh, like in, in the UAE? Uh, yes, exactly. Without license, we could uh, uh, onboard clients and partners, uh, mm -hmm. but we could not uh, do aggressive uh, marketing campaign. We couldn't hire uh, officially uh, into our LLC uh, local uh, employees. We could not uh, pay for visas, etc. for local mm -hmm. employees. Uh, but on uh, European license, we we could work globally in uh, in MENA region, and we have clients and co uh, customers base uh, extremely growing. Uh, right now, we have uh, more than eighty thousand uh, registered users, and mm -hmm. among them, around twelve thousand are active one who who purchase something in cryptocurrency world. And around 10% from them are from MENA region. So the, once we close a round, uh, it gives us a fast grow on local region with local licenses. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason why it's happened that we are grow together with market. Two years ago, there was no any license of uh, cryptocurrency in, in Dubai. There was no market. So we start from yeah. meetup. Then we do OTC, change dirham to crypto, vice versa. Then we start uh, onboarding uh, licenses. Uh, and the ne next step, we will onboard uh, tokenization license because last year Dubai allowed to build uh, security tokenization. And you could tokenize real estate, you could tokenize any, uh, any, any, any project which you own. Mm -hmm. So we grow together with market, and this is the the cool story. No, uh, thanks a lot, Kirill, for for sharing insights. So, so did you have any challenges while uh, while implementing crowdfunding? Uh, because uh, how, how did you how did you manage just the you know uh, not getting diluted that much? Uh, yes, uh, if startups doesn't have challenges, it's not a startup. Uh, <laughs> every, every every day something. Uh, happens technical programs uh, we need to change team mm. we need to do change marketing we don't have enough hands so every team member top manager we doing couple jobs so, so for example i'm doing uh, business development doing sometimes marketing sometimes diversify product and the more we grow it will be more smooth at every beginning the key challenge was uh, to uh, engage um, customers with motivation. Mm -hmm. So token holders. So we issue a token. So we distribute marketing campaign and we oh. already proof listing a scenario where they could sell those token after the IDO. IDO, IDO means initial, uh, not IDO, uh, IO, initial exchange offering. So mm -hmm. and the key problem we faced uh, once those token uh, start to build selling out and dump the price on the market because most of the tokens will be also distributed for free for marketing campaign. It's mm -hmm. kind of bounty hunters. They achieve for some steps. So we do repost, we do announcement, whatever. And during this period, we faced the problem that the investors who in re, uh, physically put money in, they purchase token uh, for, for example, four cents. And once they mm -hmm. plan to fix the profit, the bounty hunters, they dump the price for 11 cents. So they lose their profit. And what, what we do, uh, we do uh, payback from, from a second round of seed round investments. So uh, okay. there are some t t tricky scenario every day, but the, the more diversified product you have, the more solid uh, team you have, the more KPI with each steps and uh, CRM system in details you have, 
you could track mm -hmm. it, you could manage it. Because if you do not pay salaries for one day, you, you, your team will be disappeared. True, true. No, thanks a lot, uh, Kirill, for sharing uh, you know, your experience there. Uh, on this note, uh, I was just thinking, uh, Harvey, if you could just shed a little bit of light on you know, valuations of company, because you've sold quite a few of your startups. So how did you, uh, you, know, how did you manage your valuations there? So the, um, to answer your question, you know, it always depends on the stage of, of the company. You know, is the company having an EBITDA or not? So that means do you have revenue, margin, and profit, which mm -hmm. at this time, uh, in my environment of the tech com company, they have rules, you know, you have ratio of it's 10 times uh, revenue or it's eight times, you know, the, the margin. So the valuation, what we call certainly a DCF, this one is the easy one. Now, mm -hmm. if you have early stage, uh, I've got a few ways of, uh, of doing. The, the, we are not going to talk again about the team, but definitely the team has value. And you can, you know, uh, how many people, 15 people, uh, this kind of level of salary uh, bring you already a, a valuation. Uh, I have a specific method that I use, which is what makes you unique and how many unique points do you have in your company? Uh, is the ID unique? Uh, is the fact that you are on the market that is really a new market. So you list these things one by one and you give a value of each of them versus the investment you made at the beginning. So if I redo it very simple, I invest, let's say, one million in my company. Uh, I run this company for one year. I'm still not making uh, money. Uh, but I know that I'm the best to do one this thing. I know I've got the uh, best team. So I'm going to have a multiplicator of three or four and saying I already multiply by three my investment. So that's my value of my company, even if I don't make money. And when I talk like that with the investors, it's quite, it's quite working very well. Now, the one I sold were with EBITDA. So it was mm -hmm. really making revenue, having gross margin, having net margin, having profits. And here I use the classical DCF of the, uh, what everybody is using on the ratio, different market, different ratio. But uh, mm -hmm. in tech, it's, it's quite, uh, everybody knows it, you know, but the, either the, you, you have this monthly recurring revenue, you know, if you have data as a service or software as a service, it's yes. a big KPI that the people are looking for. So you have a multiplicator of uh, how much monthly revenue you have or how much annual recurring revenue you have. And that's also one way to evaluate your company. Even if you're not profitable, very often this AAR and this uh, MAR uh, is also a good way to evaluate the company. Okay, no, thanks for sharing. I think that's a really good uh, perspective from, you know, like a startup's point of view. Uh, but would love to hear from an investor's point of view, Stefan. So if you could just shed some light on what, what does an investor look at like when it comes sure. to valuation and how do you really value a company um, from an investor's perspective? Sure. I think there's three principal ways you look at value. Um, <clears throat> you look at it exactly like Ove was saying in terms of your discounted cash flow. So you're projecting, you have your current cash flows, your current uh, P&L, as it were, your profitability, and then you extrapolate that out into what's your growth uh, scenario. Um, and then, you know, you know, so maybe you've got 10 clients now making X and you're going to have 50 and then 200 and then 1,000, and you're showing over what time period you expect to, to achieve that. And then you're, you're basically running a, a, a calculation to say, on a discounted back basis, all that cash that, that arrives at a valuation of what, the, what somebody would pay today to come and buy this company. Um, that's one method. Uh, another method would be, uh, you know, looking at comparables. So if you were setting up a competitor to Zoom, for example, since we're on Zoom, we can use that as an example. So, you know, how many users, active users did Zoom have at one point in time when they raised X amount of money. So you can look at comparables to say, well, they valued themselves at this price. Um, here's some market comparables that are out there. Therefore, we're using that to look at our own valuation, uh, you know, the similar technology and drawing parallels with that. Um, but the third one, which is actually also very important is um, you have to look at what, what you call sort of like, we would say in real estate, 
you know, the replacement value. So if you're in a building, um, what's the cost of replacing that building if it, you know, heaven forbid, burnt down tomorrow and you had to build it all again? But it's the same principle for a tech startup or anything else. You know, an investor could say, look, you're very valuable um, from a certain perspective and I love what you're doing, but someone could just go and do that and pay $2 million and have exactly you. So why are you worth a hundred million? You know, so there are those questions you have to sort of look behind you as well as look forward in terms of so you know if somebody else was to come and replicate me, there's a there's a there's a cash cost to that. Mm-hmm. Um, why do we have value beyond that? And of course, there's many many good reasons why you have extreme value beyond that. First of all, that takes a lot of time. Um, so people would need to catch up. Secondly, you may have very great, strong unicorn sort of talents and products. And so, so there's a lot of factors that come into that, but I think it's important again, when you go to an investor, there's no point in saying we're worth a hundred million dollars for a piece of software or something. And then the investor looks at it and says, we could recreate this for a million, you know, you've mm-hmm. got to justify it much more compellingly than that, you know? Um, yeah. and, I think that's and- where passion comes into play. So if you have a passionate team, Mm. Um, then you know that I think that that could make them stand out otherwise yeah. like you just mentioned you know uh, a behemoth can just spend uh, millions of dollars and replicate your product if, especially if it's, uh, yeah yeah perfect so anyways uh, maybe what we could do is we could open the floor for any questions uh, uh, just quick one from the attendees. Do you have any questions there? Would you like to, you know, you could, would you like, you could unmute yourself and ask your, ask the questions or you can type it in the chat box. Okay, I think we have a question from Ramesh. Uh, oh, okay. Well, it's not really a question. It's just a question where he's just asking Stefan if you, if you could advise him with, with fundraising. <laughs> Definitely. I think, you know, you can get in touch with all the panelists separately after the session and you can definitely, uh, you know, get advice. Uh, if, uh, do we have any other questions uh, on anything relating to startups, funding from the attendees? Priyasha, may I just say something? I won't go back to the equity. Maybe this will stimulate some questions as well. Go back to the equity point earlier, because one point I wanted to add as well, um, when we were talking about bringing in people, maybe outsource, uh, you know, teams or, or you know, entities that you use on an outsource basis, give them some equity. What's so important, and I'd like everyone to really take this to heart, because what's so important when you go and raise money later on is, the investor doesn't want to see ideally 20, 25 people all with a little bit of shares in the whole thing because there's a lot of personalities there. There's a lot of alignment that needs to be there. Even if they're minorities, someone gets upset, so they can start you know, rocking the boat. And that's not what you want as an investor. You want a nice, clean structure. So ideally, if you are going to have even employees you know, having, having, having shares in the, in the entity, um, ideally, they're all in a box or in another company, which is the 20% shareholder or whatever it is in, in, the, in the main entity. Of course, the, the main entrepreneur and his team might be or he or she might be in the main entity. But if there's any other sort of very small investors, try to keep them in another box, if you will, because the investor in, in a year or two does not want to come in with big money and find that there's football teams of people all involved. Ideally, it's a real negative for an investor for for multiple reasons, but yeah. No, thanks, Stefan. In fact, we have a few more questions come by. There's a question. Uh, I think this Seppo has raised his hands. Uh, do you want to yes. quickly ask your question? Uh, am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Yeah, yeah. my question is for Kirill. So that was interesting thing that you, you were presenting about this uh, security tokenization. And, and I was wondering that, uh, is it possible for, for you to apply the license for security tokenization in, in multiple countries at the same time? Or I mean, you were mentioning like 100 plus countries where you have a license to operate. So d- did you have to do the procedure for each of those countries, even for this security tokenization license? Uh, thank you, Seppo, for your question. So let's split uh, security license, uh, tokenization li- license, and cryptocurrency exchange license. Second one, you could just uh, trade and change. Uh, for first one, security tokenization, 
it's allowed in uh, different countries, not all of them. It's allowed in uh, uh, US under the uh, SEC, it's allowed in UK, it's allowed right now in Dubai. And if you uh, apply for those uh, security tokenization license, in parallel, you need to have the whole ecosystem. You need to have verify brokers who, who could uh, track and manage the deal. You could you need to physically issue the bond or, or any other paperwork for those uh, real estate or any to, to, to tokenized assets. And in parallel, you need to have those uh, uh, security token license and you need to have the ecosystem where you could uh, sell it. So with our partner, we already run it in US. We tokenize Aspen Hotel uh, in US and we sell it through different uh, individual uh, investors through, uh, through tokens. So it's uh, actually, it's a future of tokenization. All right. I hope that answers your question, Seppo. Yes, thanks. Perfect. We have a, a couple of other questions. There's one question on what is a normal time to close a round with a VC, uh, say round one? Hobby, you want to take that? Uh, yeah, sure. So me, in my experience is that you close this one when you want really to go to market. That means your product is ready, you have already a small core team, you have already you know, money from friends and family or crowdfunding, and you want really to go and leverage your business and you want to go for the market. So it's time to do a closing of a round. So some people call it Serie A, some call it pre-Serie A. But I think this uh, this one one after friends and family, your own money and crowdfunding, I think that's the time when you go for the market, when you go for it. Yeah, and, and how long does it take? Like, let's say uh, from the time that you pitched to an investor to closing, you know, the deal, how long a time does I've it got, take? I've got the full extreme on all of my company. On my renewable energy, it took me six weeks. Oh, wow. Six weeks. Um, wow, my computer amazing. vision took me six months. Okay. Um, so, and I think that you need to know that if there's a due diligence, a little bit of audit, uh, discussion, um, I like to say, you know, it's like when you start your career, you don't choose a job, you choose a boss. So if you can choose your investor, it's very important because investors are a free resource. So you need to take some time. So I, I will say that average for me and, you know, Stefan and, and Kirill can add, uh, three to six months. You have to plan three to six months to, to mm -hmm. do good, a good funding raise. Term. I think it's uh, if it's an institutional or, or quite a sort of institutional um, uh, organization that you're trying to get money from, they, they will have committees. They may meet once a week if you're lucky, maybe once a month. Mm -hmm. uh, and they will have questions they then feel back. And of course, as Hervé was saying, there's a due diligence process. If there's a lot of due diligence to do, like a private equity house later down the road, as it were, they may take six months to, to, do, to do the due diligence. It may take nine months to close the transaction. That's more of a buyout scenario. At the startup stages, I, I totally agree. It can take anything between four to eight weeks um, if, if it's sort of like having a punt really on, on a project, much less due diligence to do. Um, but typically you should, if you're going for more of a series A, you should, you should budget three months um, because one month to sort of get to know and get it out there, another month for at least, you know, rounds of questions and Q&A, and then another month for closing is, is probably a rule of thumb I would give. Mm -hmm. No, no, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Herbie and Stefan. Um, we have an, another question from Anissa Wilkinson. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, but uh, I guess the question is, the startup market is saturated and lots of startups fail due to a lack of demand for the product. What advice would you give to a new startup to avoid this? How much time should be spent on researching demand? Who would like to take this question? I don't mind. <laughs> um, sure. Should I start? Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's a very important question. Look, it's... 
Um, it's very easy for the entrepreneur to look at, at their product and their or their idea idea as in sort of in isolation. You know, we've got the next greatest thing that's going to you know take over Google or, or take over Amazon or whatever. But but there's a, there's a couple of, of things that, that should be extremely uh, well researched when presenting your pitch deck, as it were, to other other companies or to uh, investors. Uh, one is obviously profiling other companies and the competitors out there, clearly showing that you have a differentiation to the current market. And when I say profiling, not just the names and what they're doing, but try to do the sort of volume and value, the sort of look at the value of the overall market that you're entering into and how you're going to take market share. But secondly, and also very important and far more difficult to sort of gauge sometimes is if you're coming up with a brand new great idea, how many other people are there out there that might be having the same great brand new idea, but it's not currently on any radar or anywhere else? So, for example, um, coming up with some sort of new app that responds to something that's just come front and center in everyone's world in the last month or something. But how many other people are trying to create a competitor app to that? So, uh, again, if you can pitch to the investors with the benefit of clearly showing you've looked at these areas, clearly showing that. Um, given these scenarios, you can really show uh, a clear distinction and, and an opportunity for your product or service. It's going to give them a bit of comfort. But I think also inherently, I mean, I've spoken to quite a lot of VC firms recently, and you know, a lot of them will do 60, 70, 100 investments, and they'll expect 30, 35 of them to fail, and they'll expect maybe 10 or 15 to be, you know, the real winners, uh, and the rest to be a block that will either move into winning or, or will also become losers. And that's the way it goes. So, you know, not all VC firms and things expect everyone to be a winner. Um, so, so, you know, there are some punts out there. There's some quite, quite a lot of punts out there from investors, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I will add Any the points execution. to add, Herbie? Yeah, yeah, I will add the execution. I think a lot of, uh, you know, it's, uh, again, it's, uh, it's a say from Everett Parker, most of the company die from indigestion than starvation. And I, I'm totally agree on that. So I believe that a lot of, of the startup, they fail because they don't execute. They stay on the ID, they stay on the change mind, you know, after three months, it doesn't work very well. So they, they, they try to do something else, they change a little bit. And, and I think that what makes successful people is not always the best ID is that what you execute well. And that's very important mm. for the, for the, the startup. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Execution is, it's all about execution. Ideas is, you know, something that anybody can come up with. Uh, there's one last question before we close, and that's when does a startup stop being a startup? Um, Herbie, do you want to quickly take that? Uh, as a joke, I will say, as soon as a VC gives you money, you're not a startup anymore because they consider you like a company. Mm -hmm. So you need to, to prove. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we spoke a little bit, uh, Stefan uh, mentioned a little bit the uh, scale up. You know, you, you have the startup, which mm -hmm. is really the, the beginning, the ID, you start to test the water. Uh, as soon as you got a good Serie A, uh, you start to have revenue, you have a team that are new people coming that were not at the beginning. I, I think you are already a scale-up company and you need to leverage. And uh, versus mm -hmm. the law, you know, right away you are a company, so you're already uh, not yeah. a startup anymore. So you don't, there's yeah. no room for failure. And, yeah, and Kirill, would you call your company a, a startup or, or, no, or it's no longer a startup? You're, you're crowdfunded now, so. Uh, so, uh... Before I answer the previous question, what you need to do to go through the market, you need to have a solid vision where mm -hmm. you will be at the end for which audience and if the market itself growing. So we will start our journey in 2017 with just a vision. We, first of all, we understand the minimum margin they not acknowledge at all about uh, cryptocurrency. We start to prepare the market do meetups, do introduction to the technology. Second, uh, second stage, uh, we start to jump into the ecosystem uh, where uh, traders appeared. And third one, we start to build product. So just, just uh, to compete with others local uh, uh, projects, they have even investors, they have uh, 
uh, huge money pull into, but they doesn't have product. They doesn't want to, uh, even if they have it, they doesn't know what to sell and where to sell because they uh, see the pickup points that it will be hype in future, but we do not, they do not start it like uh, two years ago. This is the, the first question. And uh, the, 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 second, the second one, uh, the, the, the easiest way uh, to understand if you are not a startup or a startup, uh, once you are responsible for your burning rate and you're responsible for your team and you're responsible for, for profit. And if your customer base growing, you are not startup anymore, but still to grow it's faster, you need to have fundraising. That's why you, you uh, close uh, around A, B, whatever around, because you want to multiply your business. Uh, we could uh, be live uh, without investors for a long journey, but together with investors, we could multiply in the short pe period of time. Great. No, thanks a lot, uh, Kirin, and uh, great insights there. Perfect. So I think uh, we've uh, run out of time. Uh, so uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank each of the panelists today, Herve, Stefan, and Kirill. Thanks a lot for sharing your insights. Uh, thank you to all the attendees for joining us today. I hope you found this panel discussion insightful. We are hosting uh, a lot many more, uh, you know, events uh, during the Connected Insights uh, web summit. So please do check out our website. Oh, there's a, we do have a photo, a quick photo before we uh, close. So uh, I don't know, Elsa, Elsa is the one who would be taking it. I think uh, if you could all switch on your videos, that would be great. Just for a quick minute before we sign off. A few seconds before we sign off. Oh, that's nice. That's nice to see all of you. Thank you. I'll just give everybody two more minutes to turn on the video and then we'll take the picture. Yeah. Okay, awesome. One, two, three, and please everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye, bye, everyone. Take care. Thank you very much. Peace. Yeah, thanks, Stefan.